All right, so this is lecture five of ECE 503. Okay, so um, it's actually interesting. So talking during the break, um, uh, one, one, one student indicated that for the uh, quiz that we just did earlier this evening, uh, he actually used uh, Z transforms in order to solve it, um, which, is, which, is, which is interesting because that's what we're going to be talking about now. So, so again, like this, uh, these, these few lectures, starting from one and uh, continuing on for up until the end of this uh, class and such, is really to bring everybody to the sort of same place in terms of the uh, tools that we'll need in order to do the DSP um, um, concepts and algorithms and, and the like, especially filtering later on in this course. Um, so, so in fact, you, what the purpose of the Z transform? There are a number of there are a number of reasons why we have Z transforms. Um, so, one of which actually is to simplify mathematical operations. Like, for instance, if, like the second problem on your quiz, um, you know, if if let's say in doing all those mess, like in general, you can avoid doing convolutions altogether if you just put everything into Z transform domain because it becomes a product for the most part. And then you multiply, you take the inverse Z transform. The inverse Z transform is actually where things get kind of sticky. So as we'll see a little bit later on, um, especially because you're playing with contour integrals, which is not fun. But uh, for the most part, that's one feature of the Z transform. Actually, another feature of the Z transform that comes in very useful is it's, it's used as an analytical technique for figuring out the behavior of the signal or system that you're playing with. So things like stability and causality and, and the like can also be characterized using the Z-transform. So uh, what is the Z-transform? So the Z-transform is another way of, uh, you know, is a way of representing a discrete time signal system in terms of a frequency. So um, whereas you have Fourier transforms uh, that deal with continuous time signals, and you also have discrete time Fourier transforms, what the Z-transform does is Almost the same thing. It's like if you look at it, the, the form. So we have the expressions, the general expressions here. So you have x of z is equal to the infinite summation of x of n, z to the minus n. And the summation is across all n. It's interesting because if you look at that z of n, the z to the minus n, what's a Fourier transform? This is almost the same format, right? Discrete time Fourier transform with the exception that z is equal to e to the j omega, and omega is your frequency term, right? So it's almost the same. However, uh, there are some differences. So uh, whereas uh, the Fourier transform is e to the j omega, um, z here we can assume actually might have the form of r e to the j omega. We also have a radial component, which we'll talk about later, because unlike Fourier transforms, we have to worry about something called regions of convergence. That, that, to me, um, will require sort of like, you know, as opposed to discrete time Fourier transforms, uh, the Z transforms, that's, that's really, there, there's a law of effort in order to understand how ROCs work. All right? And there are other notations. So if you see me throughout the notes and throughout the rest of this course, represent, like, let's say I have this X of Z is equal to big swoopy Z squiggly brackets, x of n, that's also my shorthand for saying, take the z transform of this thing. Um, and then there's also this, which shows that there's a, there's a z transform relationship between x of n and x of z. All right? So let's, go, let's, let's see that region of convergence thing that I was talking about. So suppose I express, like let's say that region of convergence, um, so when we're dealing with these z's, right, these z values, and we'll, we'll, we'll equate it to both a phase and a radial component, what happens is the way we're expressing that z transform, if we revisit it, like let's say we go back here. What is this z transform? The z transform is nothing more than a power series, right? So as a result, we need to make sure that this power series converges, right? So as a result, we need to choose, we need to select values of z, or better yet, we need to understand for what values of z that this guy remains bounded, right? This guy converges. And so we need to do a little bit of, um, little bit of analysis here. So what we do is the challenge is finding that region of convergence. We need to specify for what values of z 
this thing converges to. It doesn't explode, right? So the first thing we do is we represent z in terms of polar coordinates, a polar form. And again, this has a law of similarity to your um, uh, Fourier transform, right? e to the j theta, e to the j omega. And so let's take the magnitude. Let's forget about the, frequent, uh, the, the phase for now of your z transform or your expression here. Let's just take the magnitude. Let's explore it. So if we take the magnitude of the z trans, uh, the, the, the x of z um, and equate it to the z transform expression, right? So what we've got is if we rewrite it all, let's replace z with this polar form. And what we notice is that does the magnet in a magnitude of an expression, does it matter that we have um, um, you know, the phase term? No. So what we first do is we have this expression. It's the magnitude of the summation of terms. What do we know? What do we know? We, what, do we care about ex uh, inequality? No. What we can do is we, all we care about is some sort of bound. Well, what, I, I would prefer writing this out. So. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, so boop, pen. Maybe we do full screen. Okay. So let's say we have x of z. And uh, we have the summation, right? So we have n to the minus infinity to plus infinity. We have x of n and uh, z to the minus n, correct? So that's the z transform. So what, what we want is, let's say we want to figure out what the regions of convergence is. So, so let's see. So let's first of all take the magnitude of the z transform. Then what I want to do is let z equal to some polar form. Okay? And, and replace it in this expression. So now we got r to the minus n, and we have e to the minus j theta n. Now, what's kind of interesting is, let's pull a little trick. Let's make an inequality. So we know that you know, we have a summation of terms. Some could be positive, some can be negative, some can be complex, right? Sum them all together, and then take the, the magnitude of that, right? We know that, suppose we take the magnitude of the individual terms before they're summed together. They'll actually establish an upper bound on this other summation. So if instead of taking the summation of all these terms and take the magnitude, how would it look like if we instead do this? So now we take the magnitude of each one of these terms. Right? So what should theoretically happen? So each one of these terms, we take the magnitude of it, right? So it's going to be a positive value. We're, it's not going to be complex. It's going to be real. And we're going to sum them all together. It's going to be larger. The sum of all those magnitude terms is going to be larger than this guy here. OK? Now, the reason why I want to do this is I, I'll, I don't really care about finding the precise value that this guy converges to. I just want to know that it converges. Right? Hmm. So um, one thing to pay attention to is, does phase, that's a phase term, does phase actually matter when you're uh, computing a magnitude? Absolutely not. Right? So let's get rid of the phase term. So at the end of the day, this guy here is actually going to look like this. It's going to look like magnitude, right? And now what, what ends up happening is we want to know the values of r that this actually behaves. So now we have this new series representation. So what, what we want to do is let's say this is going to be equal to, OK? Uh, so we have e to the minus infinity to the minus 1. And what we're going to do is uh, this guy here uh, sort of break it up, right? 
And also we have n to the 0 to plus infinity. Okay, And you might say, OK, why? And so the reason is, is that I'm going to play a little trick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this guy here, and I'm going to uh, flip, flip him around. So I'm going to negate n throughout this entire expression. Okay. So what I'm going to do is instead um, start it at n equals um, 1 okay, and go to infinity. And so what happens? So what do we have? So first of all, we're going to have this guy. And we're also going to have this guy. Whereas in this case, what we're going to have is n equals 0 in infinity. And then we're going to have this guy. And we're going to have 1 over rn, right? And so, so right now, what I'm doing is I want to find values for this r, right, where this does not blow up. So let's let's switch over. So we'll, we'll put this on pause. We'll go back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Microsoft. So so why do I care about this? Because this is what I, I'm looking at. Yeah. So so what happens is if I redefine the right hand side and I get to this, um, what I care about is the value of r, and what you're going to find out is the choice of R is going to determine uh, whether you have that region of convergence, right? Um, so let's say in a theoretical world, suppose this guy here. So what, what does this mean? So what we end up happening is we have all these magnitudes of these terms all summed up from 1 to infinity. And um, what ends up happening is um, at some point we're going to have a point like a, where, um, like a pole or something, where it's going to explode. And so as a result, that radius cannot exceed beyond that pole. In this case, um, our region of convergence, this guy here, this r, will it explode at value 0, at the origin? No. But it will at infinity, right? So this expression here, so look at r. For any, like, for what values of r, if we sum this up all the way to infinity, which one would blow up? So if I plug in r um, given n equals 1, n equals 2, blah, 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 um, is, there, is there a single value of r uh, from 0 to infinity that would cause this to explode? And the answer is yes, and that's infinity. So we cannot include infinity, and probably there's a root somewhere that actually restricts us to something even closer to the origin. If we plug in 0, so what does r mean? r is your radius, right? Oh, sorry. So if your radius is 0, does this thing explode? No. But if your radius is infinity, yes, it will explode. So we cannot include infinity. And in fact, this format, potentially, we don't know what exactly the roots are, but we'll have some sort of disk like this. And inside that disk, any value of r is legitimate. We can actually use it. On the other hand, this other half that I just, we just derived as well, what happens if the radius goes off to infinity? Does it explode? No, not at all. But if I have it at the origin, it sure will. So in this case, our region of convergence will be the area outside of the, uh, outside of the origin. And again, just keeping things general, what happens is there might be a possibility where we have roots. And we'll explain what roots are a little bit later in this class as well as in the next one. And so what ends up happening is if I have um, um, like, you know, this sort of concept, what I really want is, is there, like, what we want is we want to choose a value of r where this does not explode and this does not explode. So we want essentially two regions of convergence that overlap on top of each other. They have to overlap. And therefore, we have a value, a ring of R values, that will enable us to get a non-exploding output. If we don't have that overlapping regions of convergence for the first and second half of this expression, 
We don't have a solution, right? On the other hand, if we have an overlapping, and this is an illustration, what I mean by overlapping. We'll, we'll look at a few examples in a few minutes. What will happen is we do have overlapping regions of convergence for first and second part. That means there is a solution, there is a value of R where we can actually have something that doesn't go poof. So this is what I mean. So let's say, let, let's just think conceptually. So in general, so if we have a finite duration signal, right? So essentially, it's like let's say it's non-zero at zero, and da, 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 it goes, but it, it, it's non-zero at zero, but it does not have any non-zero components for times less than zero, and then there's a finite number of points where it's non-zero in the positive direction, like you know, at time equals one, two, three, four. What's the region of convergence? It's going to be the entire plane less the origin. And why is that? Let's go to our previous expression. This guy, right? From n equals zero to infinity, like this guy here does not exist, right? We don't have to worry about because all these samples are zero, essentially. This guy, that's what's representing this expression over here, right? This is when we have only positive um, uh, um, time indexes. The value, values are only defined in the positive time indexes, in which case we have to worry about him, in which case the only thing that will prevent us from having um, an issue, like, you know, like basically the um, Z transform exploding, is when r is equal to zero, right? The denominator is zero, it, it blows up. So the region of convergence theoretically is the entire plane less the origin. If it's the negative, exactly the same thing. Let's go back. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be these values here going in negative time. And what happens is, what ends up happening is, it's, the region of convergence is everything except infinity. Now, if we have both positive and negative finite signals, right? So that after a while they stop. They don't go all the way to infinity. What ends up happening is we have both these terms, in which case both the origin and infinity are not included, but everything else is. Now, if we have infinite duration signals, it's a different story. So what ends up happening is when we have an infinite duration signal, now we have to worry about the case of we have some sort of root. So what we'll see later when we deal with Z transforms and poles and zeros is that poles and zeros are points where in the Z plane, the Z domain, if we have a pole, that will result in a discontinuity. That will result. If we have a pole, it's going to blow up. So whenever we have Z or an R value that corresponds to a pole, it's going to be something divided by zero. And we have something divided by zero, we have a discontinuity, and we can't contain that within our region of convergence. And so we need to decide at that point, do we want to be outside of that, um, at that pole and everything around it, or as we'll see later, or uh, inside it? And that will depend on whether infinity is included or not, or the origin is included or not. The same thing can be said with respect to uh, an infinite duration signal that goes off to minus infinity. Same thing, except that now we don't include infinity, but we include everything within the smallest uh, z uh, pole uh, of that um, Z transform. And then likewise, if we have both negative, and, like infinite uh, duration signals going both in negative and positive time, we, we have the combination of the two regions of convergence. So, so these illustrations they're a little bit convoluted, so we're going to work through some examples where this will be made more apparent, where we really want to avoid anything that caused this thing to be divided by zero. Really, that's the bottom line. When we play with Z transforms, we ultimately want to set it up such that we do not have a divide by zero scenario. And the best way to do it, so we're going to deal with one type of Z transform, um, which is a, a collection of rationals. We have um, a collection of what we call poles and zeros and that's sort of a breakdown of a polynomial of z's, so rational z transform. And what we'll see is that um, if we break it up into roots in the numerator and roots in the denominator, the roots in the numerator, they're cool. They're just going to result in the z transform equals zero when we reach that value. But 
roots in the denominator are bad news, because if z is equal to one of those roots, that's when we have divide by zero scenario in the z transform. So this is a little bit more of an illustration. Okay. So I mentioned about the inverse z transform and not being fun. This is the reason why it's not fun. Um, it uses something called a contour integral. Um, it's highly unlikely we're going to be using any contour integrals in this course. So a contour integral, so it's represented by this expression here. Uh, what you do is you uh, integrate your z transform to uh, you know you, you integrate uh, your z transform in its region of convergence following a specific contour that's within the ROC in order to retrieve what your original time signal looks like. Again, it's a little bit more complicated. In this course, what we're going to do is, especially when we play with uh, the rational type of um, uh, z-transforms, uh, what we're going to do is we try and break down our z-transforms into recognizable, typical, like, you know, like pattern match. So, oh, that z-transform, it has this time domain representation. Oh, and that z-transform, this has this time domain representation. So what we're going to do is, rather than brute force finding the inverse z transform, what we'll do instead is we're going to say, oh, okay, I know that, and you just work backwards. And if you call it out, you say, oh yeah, that, that's, that, 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 that's the z transform for this, ta-da, I'm happy with it. And that's how most people do that, right? Okay, so um, a small laundry list, again, of properties of the z transform. This is similar, again, to uh, Fourier transforms. So you have linearity property. So if you have a z transform of x1 and you have a z transform of x2, so if you take x1, like a times x1 plus a, b times x2, and you add them together and you take a z transform, it will be the uh, weighted sum of their z transforms. That's it. So basically, the z transform is a linear operator, right? Time shifting, if you have a time shift, in your, uh, your, in your time domain signal, that's going to be reflected as a z to the minus k. So a delayed version, uh, like a delay of z to the minus k multiplied by your z transform of x of n, which is going to be x of, it, of x of z. If you scale in the time domain your signal, like a n x of n, right, uh, the z transform of that will be x a minus 1 z. And you can work these out by, by uh, first principles. Again, the textbook actually provides sort of the brute force derivation of all this. And then there's several others, such as time reversal. There's differenti differentiation in the z domain, convolution of two sequences. That's powerful stuff. So in today's quiz, if you use the, the uh, um, convolution of two sequences, what ends up happening in the time domain is convolution. In the frequency domain, it's simple product, right? So that's why, I like, that's why I love working the frequency domain. You don't have to play with convolution. Oh, yeah. You know, if you can avoid a convolution, uh, go for it. Don't tell it to the convolution people. So um, correlation of two sequences, just like we sort of talked about at the end of the last lecture, the con correlation of two sequences um, really breaks down almost into uh, the following. So it, it's, it looks kind of like a co uh, convolution, but there's no time flipping. And what you end up getting is almost a product, but instead of the product you have, one of the z's is actually z to the minus 1 in the argument, rather than z. Multiplication of two sequences, unfortunately, you get something that kind of looks like a very weird contour integral of a convolution. So use at your own risk, right? And then finally, Parseval's theorem. So Parseval's theorem is very handy with respect to um, if you're trying to relate, let's say, the energy of a signal, uh, how you, uh, if you either work in the frequency domain or the time domain, and that's given by this expression here. Again, it's very similar to the Parseval's theorem in your Fourier transform repre um, uh, representations. And again, like in your textbooks, there's an entire slew of these properties in Table 3.2. What I would recommend doing, if you don't have an electronic version, if you have the paper version of your textbook, which some people do, some people don't, um, put a little plastic tab on it because you, that, that to me is like, you know, you're going to be using that even nowadays in my office whenever I need to figure out a Z transform for something. I go to my textbook, I find a plastic tab, move to it, boom, Z transform table. So it's really, really helpful. 
Um, also, for like quizzes and stuff that I will give, um, I usually will include either the entire Z transform table or provide, like, let's say, these are some of the Z transforms that you'll need. Or if it's open book quizzes like these, bring your textbooks and make sure you have that tab so you can quickly reference it. There's also, this is kind of the thing that will come up in your uh, problem sets as well. There, in addition to table 3.2, table 3.3 provides a list of useful Z transform pairs. And the reason why that's there is that was the pattern matching thing I was telling you guys about. So, like, suppose you have this Z transform thing. So let's say you decompose it and you have this simple thing and you say, I remember that. This has a time domain representation that looks like this. That's where you bring up um, uh, you know, those Z transform pairs. Now, um, th in fact, how do we use table 3.3 really comes down to that rational Z transform business I was talking about with poles and zeros. So this is what I mean. So suppose you have a Z transform and all it is is a collection of Z, a polynomial in the numerator consisting of, of um, of z's, right, and at different powers. That so basically is some sort of geometric, se uh, geometric sequence of z's in the numerator and geometric sequence of z's in the denominator. So you have the sum. The beautiful thing about this is that you can actually decompose this into roots, right? The first thing you want to do is you basically want to take the numerator, decompose it into roots, take the denominator, decompose it into roots, and then from there you use this technique called partial fraction expansion. And that, the PFE, like when I taught this course two years ago, um, and again, it, it, it's so deceptive. Partial fraction expansion is like, hey, how difficult does this be? It's not calculus. It's not differential equations. It should be straightforward. Yeah, but it's still tedious and finding roots and a lot of, uh, you know, handiwork in terms of getting there. So the beautiful thing about the partial fraction expansion is that once you get your rational Z transform into this form, you can actually decompose it into first order segments. So what do I mean by that? What I mean to say is, suppose you get into a collection of roots here. What you can do is through PFE, you can actually decompose it into, let's say you have a first order segment that has this pole, and then there's some business on top. And it could be anything. The partial fraction expansion can go any which way depending on how you decompose it. And then you have another first, first order section and it has a second, th this set up, this pole here, and then third and fourth and fifth and so on and so forth. And so PFE is a really powerful tool which we're, we will see later in this lecture. Um, and then this thing will also come up time and time again, especially when we deal with filtering. So when we talk about system function, so system function is the frequency representation of your impulse response for your system. So, you know, when we talk about analyzing a system, this, like, you know, looking for uh, whatever, causality or boundedness and such, um, we usually go into the frequency domain. And so what we have here is whenever we want to find what is the Z transform of the impulse response of a system, it's actually equal to the Z transform of the output divided by the Z transform of the input. That's actually where, in a lot of cases, we get these rational, these rational Z transforms. This is almost always how we get it. So remember before when we had the partial, um, sorry, the linear constant coefficient difference equations? This is it. Remember the di direct form one, direct form two? So this guy here essentially provides with us like, in, in fact, remember what we call those constant coefficients multiplied by the delayed versions of the input values? Remember they're all Bs? This here represents all the delayed versions of all the input values, and the denominator represents all the delayed versions of the output values. If I were to draw this, I would get direct form 2, right? And so that's why when we play with um, this sort of system transfer function, and we have y's and we have x's, and we represent it, we usually get this, and then when we have this, we actually can do partial fraction expansion. So how do we do it? So how do we take the inverse of the z transform? So let's, let's cut across to um, partial fraction expansion. 
So, so the way you do PFE and your homer, your problem set that you're going to uh, be uh, that will be posted tomorrow is full of PFE problems, right? So the goal of PFE is to take the rational x of z, and and it's full of polynomials and decompose it into a sum of way simpler terms. And so actually, section 3.4.3 gives you a lot of little tricks on how to do this, but. Um, let's, let's actually work one out. So, so let's say we have this guy here. So we have x of z, 1 over 1 minus 1.5z 1 to the minus 1 plus 0.5z to the minus 2. So what we want to do, first of all, is let's get rid of the z to the minus whatever terms. Let's, let's multiply both numerator and denominator by z to the 2, right? z squared. So if you multiply, so Hey. So let's say you had something like this. I forgot it was plus or minus. Anyone remember? Minus. minus. Thank you. And plus? Yeah. Yay. Thank you. So just, just as an aside, how does this look like in terms of, uh, you know, direct form 2? Direct form 2. So, so what this will look like as follows. So let's say that's our input, that's our output. And what it looks to me is, so x of n is just going in, no problem. y of n is going out, no problem. And so what, what ends up happening is I have a delay element with the output, z to the minus 1. Um, and then this guy goes here. We multiply by minus 1.5. Uh, we, we then go through another delay element, minus 1. And then this guy here, he's multiplied by 0.5. He goes here. We add. And we go here. We add. So that's what this guy will look like, right? And that's based off of this numerator here will tell me what my uh, inputs look like in terms of the delay and the constant coefficient. And then this guy here will tell me what my outputs will look like. And from that, I can characterize this. So oh. <laughs> sorry. So from that, we can actually describe our system using this sort of layout. Now, the first step that I want to do, just to simplify life, is let's say I do nothing. Easier said than done, right? So what I do is I multiply and divide. So I multiply both the numerator and denominator by z to the 2. I'm doing nothing, right? I haven't changed anything, except that now what I'm doing is I'm trying to make the math a little bit more easier to manipulate. So if I do that, what I end up getting is I have z now to the square on the top, and then the bottom is z squared minus 1.5z, right? And then plus 0.5. So now what I want to do is find the roots of the denominator. So what are the roots? One and one half? Let's see. So z um, minus one? Minus one. And um, z one half. Plus one half? Minus, minus one half. OK. So And so, thank you. So now what we have is, okay, this is great. So now we have um, the all-important roots. Ultimately, what I would like to do, right, is I would like to have, essentially, um, something like z to the minus 1, a1, plus a2, z to the minus 1 half. Yeah, that's minus, minus or plus, second one. Still minus, OK, thank you. So what ends up happening is now that I have this format, I'm going to say, OK, cool. Um, now I have, like, this is ultimate format. Because what you'll see is in table, so, let, so this guy here, if we can find out what these guys look like after we find out what a1 and a2 are equal to, then you use, again, this is now where another plastic tab in your books would be, use table 3.3 and you pattern match. What does this guy, once you solve for a1, look like? What does this guy, once a2 is solved for, what do these guys look like? And then you just say, 
by table 3.3 in course textbook, this guy has a time domain version that looks like this. So, and same thing with the second part. Yes, please keep it. <laughs> so, what ends up happening is, if we go to that, right, so you solve for the poles, those are the roots of the denominator, and just as I said, what you want to do is, in this case, um, what you want to, first of all, you want to want to do is you want the order of the numerator to be less than the order of the denominator. So we, we played a little trick here. So we divide by z, uh, that, that guy. So now we have z uh, over z to the minus 1 and z. So what we're doing is we made this little trick. We now say uh, what we want to do is we multiply both sides by z to the minus 1 times z to the minus 0.5. And that now gives us this guy here. And you might say, OK, cool. Uh, why is that? So, so the reason is, so, so we now have both sides. So we have this guy and we have that guy. So we get rid of the denominator here. Now we have a to the, a to the 1. And whatever that this guy multiplies with, it's going to cancel. Uh, z minus 1 is going to cancel. with that z minus 1? And we're left with the point minus 0. 0.5. And here we're going to be left with the minus 1. And then what you do is you simply figure out, if you plug in 0 is equal to 0. 0.5, one of those two terms is going to zero out. And now, what is left-hand side equal to right-hand side? Right? You then do the other value. You plug in z is equal to 1. So let me... Okay. Okay. So let's go back. So this guy here. Okay. And so what we do is we know that this is going to be a1, z to the minus 1, and a2, z to the minus 0.5, right? And so now what we do is we say, okay, multiply both sides. Multiply. And so if we multiply both sides by the denominator, by denom, right? What will end up happening is we have z is equal to so we take this guy, so the denominator will disappear. Here, the z minus 1 is going to disappear, and what we're going to be left with is z to the minus 0. 0.5. And here, that guy is going to disappear, and we're going to be left with z to the minus 1. So we're going to have a z to the minus 0. 0.5 plus a z to the minus 1. And so now what we do is let z equal to 0. 0.5. What's going to happen is that guy is going to be 0, right? So it's going to be equal to 0 0.5 is equal to a1. Oh, look at that. That's 0. We don't have to worry about him. a2.5 minus 1. So that's going to be minus 0.5. And so what we get is 0 0.5 is equal to a2 minus 0.5. So in the end, a2 is going to be equal to minus 1. Now, let's repeat. Let z is equal to 1. And so now what we got is 1 is equal to a1, 1 minus 0.5, and then plus a2, 0. So that guy disappears. Isolate again. And what we get is this guy, a1 is equal to 2. So what we get is xz over z is going to be equal to 2 over z to the minus 1 plus minus 1. So, so minus 1 over z to the minus 0. 0.5. And then these are of the form, if you look in your, in, like you look at, table 3.3, .3, what you're going to find out is that these, these guys have a known form. And then, so you don't have to do contour integrals, okay? Please, 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 don't do contour integrals. 
And so if you do that, I have to turn off the audio. <laughs> when, when you do that, you actually get, at the end of the day, so you have these guys, and I, I actually didn't find it, but if you look in your textbook, uh, they, they both have a, um, a known form that you can actually, um, you can actually solve. So, um, in a nutshell, so PFE, so this is actually really important because uh, you'll use this a lot, especially later on when we play with um, filters. Yes? Can you put that green back in? Yeah, so, so that's actually an excellent question. So you can actually then put it back in. So that's an excellent question. So you can multiply now both sides by Z, and then what you can do, once you have them multiply by Z, now multiply numerator and denominator by Z to the minus 1, Z to the minus 1, and that's actually, that's exactly where your expression, um, that's how it's expressed in table 3.3. It's not in terms of z's, but z's to the minus 1's. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Okay, good. So with that, uh, that concludes uh, lecture uh, 5 of ECE 503. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to wrap things up with the 6th lecture. So we don't